I'm muted. Before we go too far, I will sort of orient people as to where we are located. So we're on the south coast of BC, and um, we are going to be looking at Richmond and Delta, which is this section here. So Richmond is falls under the purvey of Vancouver Coastal Health, and this entire project is essentially spanning the highway that runs between Richmond and Delta. Um, and to get there, we need to go through a tunnel currently. So Richmond is home to about just over 200,000 people, and Delta is home to about 100,000 people. Richmond is really well known for being the home of our airport, so where people get their connections to and from, and Delta is from the most Part, it's probably best known for its connection to the Tawakon Ferry Terminal, so getting everybody to and from Vancouver Island and back to Vancouver. Um, so that's pretty much our location. Um, with regards to our health authority boundaries, unfortunately this project actually spans two health authorities. So in BC, we are split up into five different health authorities, and, and we are um, Vancouver Home the Health looks after Richmond, and Greater Health will take care of the Delta side. Or, um, and so we both participated in the environmental assessment, but in very different capacities. Within Vancouver Coastal Health, we found that it was a really great opportunity for our health development environment team to get involved, and so we decided to put a whole crew of people on this project. Whereas with Fraser Health, they had their medical health officer and their human health risk reduction specialist participate. So this is a pretty good picture of the day-to-day -day commute for a lot of people who are going through Richmond and into Delta. So the Delta, or sorry, the George Matthew Tunnel currently has about 80,000 cars a day. Um, and it's a four-lane tunnel, two lanes each way. Um, and it connects to YBR, the US border crossing, Tawasa Ferry Terminal, Delta Port, Boundary Bay. So it's essentially connecting anything coming from the south of um, the Metro Vancouver area, which would be Delta, all the way into downtown Vancouver. So without this tunnel, it's a massive piece of our infrastructure. And it's vital to our business movement route. Um, interestingly, the tunnel was actually built and finished in 1959, and it was very integral into connecting Delta and Richmond to Vancouver prior to 1959. These areas weren't actually connected very well to Vancouver, and so we kind of needed something. And so what we've seen is that because Delta is so much smaller, it's needing that, um, it's really wanting a huge um, transportation corridor to connect it to the greater or the, the hub of Vancouver. So our project overview. So the proponent is the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. And the project itself consists of replacement of the four-lane tunnel. And it will include an HOB lane. And so the replacement of the four-lane tunnel actually means um, turning it into a 10-lane bridge. So this includes an HOB lane or transit-specific lane. And it will also include the on and off ramp replacements all the way through. So you can imagine going from four lanes to ten lanes and quite the extension of highway um, on and off ramp planning, a lot of engineering going in place. It also includes the tunnel decommissioning. So tunnel decommissioning, the tunnel is actually set up in six spots and it will be taken up for for the middle sections will actually be taken out. I'm going to move the mic a little bit because people online are saying they have a bit of trouble hearing with the mic on. So, sorry if I could just get you to speak a little louder. Okay, the mic. We will try. Um, all right. Uh, so, the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure actually put together a staff sheet for all of the for the general public. Um, and they promoted the project as a green project. And so they talked about the six key factors, essentially environmental enhancement and restoration. So they wanted to talk about some of the ways that they can improve um, the existing green areas. So in Delta, they have burn fog, 
but also D slew, which is actually right between, right underneath the current configuration of where the bridge will be. And so they wanted to take those opportunities to enhance the natural areas that currently exist. They committed to world-class transit, so that means that in their plans, they have one lane dedicated to transit and HOV capacity going both ways, and then potential for rapid transit to be integrated into the bridge at a later date should funding ever become available. They wanted to look at safety and resilience. So currently the tunnel doesn't have the greatest seismic um, standard, doesn't meet current seismic standards. And so there's been a lot of upgrades over the last, say, 10 years to try to reinforce the tunnel so that it would be meeting reasonable seismic standards. But they're hoping that right now there's not any um, shoulder width for emergency vehicles to get through in the tunnel. So if there's an accident in the tunnel, it can be really hard for emergency vehicles to get in. Um, and it can actually, so that picture that I showed with the, the, um, the current lineup can actually, that can be a five kilometer long car pileup if there's an accident on route on the tunnel. So you can kind of imagine where, when there is an emergency, so right now all lanes of traffic are blocked so their thoughts are that if they expand it to 10 lanes, that they will be able to ha have continuous flow of traffic while being able to reach an emergency situation. Um, they also wanted to improve traffic movement. So, of course, very similar, making sure that there's always continuous flow of traffic. Efficient goods movement, um, so that really pertains to having good on and off ramp services making sure that we have free flow of traffic, and then numbers. So this bridge is going to be about three kilometers long. It's going to be 10 lanes wide, and so it's also going to be one of the longest and biggest, uh, widest cable state bridges in North America. And it's also projected to contribute quite significantly to the BC economy. So creating lots of jobs, not only in construction, but also in the materials required for construction. So why health? Um, so why are we interested in this project? Why did we want to get involved? Um, we looked at, so I've adopted this diagram from uh, Dr. Frank um, at UBC. And essentially his philosophy is if you plan a community well, you affect urban patterns, which then affect travel choices and alter behaviors, um, which then impacts people's health because it's impacting the decisions that they're making. So with this project, the planning of the route, i.e. development of a 10-lane bridge, affects the urban pattern. So how people are being able to travel between Delta and Richmond, and therefore choosing changing potentially the travel choices or altering the behaviors that people are using to get from one point to another. So this bridge will be paid for by tolls. Right now it's a user toll system. So that may affect people's choices. They may choose to use an alternate bridge and use a longer route. We've seen that with other bridges in the lower mainland. Um, people avoiding the toll route so that they can go on the free route. Um, it may also impact the number of cars that are coming and traveling across the bridge. And so that could also impact population health. So if people are choosing to drive over this magnificent 10-lane bridge because they get to go from place to place you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes after, um, maybe they'll be driving a lot more often. And so um, that's, that's something that we want to look at, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a little bit. So traditionally, our um, large infrastructure projects, such as this one, really looked at health impacts as being noise and air quality. And so when they evaluated the environmental assessment for the GMT, um, George Massey Tunnel, they assessed health as the changes in air quality and noise levels. So they used indicators such as inhalation and exposure risk, and percent noise, sleep disturbance, speech comprehension speech comprehension from various areas around um, the location of where the bridge will be. And my suspicion is that in previous or similar projects in the past, um, they were asked to only look at air and noise quality aspects 
because that's just what's traditionally been asked for. They're easily quantifiable. You can measure them. Um, you can sort of monitor your progress over time. However, we have a little bit of a different perspective on health. So I am part of the Three Man Built Environment team with Vancouver Coastal Health. And as part of our team, we have a perspective that considers the WHO definition of health, so a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of death, or sorry, disease or infamy, as well as common definitions of the built environment. So all human-made or altered physical structures and surroundings in the areas that we live, learn, work, and play. So we work to impact health outcomes by preventing disease and injury, and create healthy places and relationships for improvements to the built environment. So we really want to focus on reduction of chronic disease, improvement of people's health, and achievement equity, achieving equity and health status. And our belief is that the way that we build our communities and the way that we build our, our environments will have a significant impact on people's health by affecting the choices that they're making. So this includes the way that we design our neighborhoods, our transportation networks, um, how we impact our natural environment, our food systems, housing, social connections, et cetera, et cetera. And this holistic approach to a health scale beyond air quality and noise is sort of new, especially for large projects like this. So our engagement spanned essentially the entirety of 2016. We had some initial involvement um, in July 2015, where we first started talking about the possibility of an HIA being conducted. Um, but really, we weren't invited to the working group. And no significant work really happened until January 2016. Um, and so our involvement really consisted of attending working group meetings and revision of all the documents that lead up to the submission to the ministers so that they can get approval to do this project. Um, and so, like I mentioned, throughout the process, we really requested for a really quite a long time um, that a health impact assessment or an HIA would be great to have conducted because we really saw that this project had a lot of potential to impact health. Um, and so we were met with quite a bit of resistance because the proponent was sort of like, well, why would we do a health impact assessment when we're already doing a health, human health risk assessment? And we are evaluating human health as a value component. And you know, like what, what would the value add of a health impact assessment be? Um, and so we really had to kind of take a step back and explain that a human health risk assessment is much more specific than a health impact assessment. Um, you know, an HHRA is used to inform an HIA, but an HIA really looks at a broader scale and scope of what health could be and how health might be affected by such a project. So our first meeting was in January 2016, and we met with the Environmental Assessment Office of BC, which is the EAO, and they conduct all the environmental assessment reviews in the province, and the proponent, the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, MOTI. And in this meeting, they went through each of the value components. And those are the elements that are considered to be, um, to have some significant scientific, ecological, social, cultural, archaeological, historical, or other importance. And those are the things that are going to be assessed throughout the application. And so they included fish and fish habitat, amphibians, wildlife, mammals, vegetation, land use, human health, et cetera, et cetera. What we found is that our engagement really started when we got to review the draft information application, application information requirements, and also known as the DAIR. Um, and we found that the process for the environmental assessment isn't actually well suited for our comments, possibly because of the lens that we came at the project with, because we wanted to, we would have preferred to have evaluated the different options. Because unfortunately, with this process, by the time you get to an environmental assessment, the project has already been sort of quite well defined. Um, by the time we got involved, they'd already decided to do propose a 10-lane bridge. Um, and I think the perspective that we came at the project 
asked with was that, well, it would be really nice if we could do a health impact assessment to evaluate the five different options that were originally up for consideration. Um, so that really bounded us in terms of what feedback we were able to provide. Um, the application information requirements, or the error, is sort of like a table of conflict Sorry, a table of contents, and so it identifies all the components that will be addressed and what will be assessed in the actual application. So it doesn't actually sort of lay out everything that is assessed, or it doesn't actually tell you any conclusions, but it says these are the things that we're going to be looking at. <coughs> it's funny because in their template, in the EAO's template for the AIR, it actually says that the health value component could include things such as worker safety, uh, worker health, recreational aesthetic features, le levels of physical activity, indicators of community health, um, but these are all things that are kind of hard to measure, and as I mentioned before, I think traditionally we really have only focused on the things that are easily quantifiable and measurable. So our original initial reading happened in 2016 for January, February, and we brought forward comments such as health should be considered as a criterion to evaluate the potential crossings. So that, again, sort of speaks to the lens that we came at the project with. We also talked about the effects of air quality. Um, so we talked about how the bottleneck that currently exists in that picture that I showed of the um, commuting uh, gridlock might actually shift northwards up to Oak Street Bridge, which is up this way here, where the red circle is. Um, and so we also spoke to possible longer queue lengths in that area. And so what we asked for was that the local assessment area, or LAA, be expanded to include the Oak Street Bridge as a component. Um, and we'll kind of, I'll be touching on that quite a bit um, coming up. Um, so we did make that recommendation because essentially um, the project really consisted of whatever is covered in purple was what was assessed, and it was one kilometer beyond the purple line in terms of its assessment and not beyond. We also asked for consideration of economic conditions. So we brought forward the fact that health, uh, particularly with respect to chronic disease, makes up a huge um, portion of our provincial budget. And so while there are economic factors that built that um, heavily supported the construction of a tunneling bridge, um, the potential negative effects to health should have been considered as that might also be driving up huge health care costs. We also looked at the built environment. So again, if the bridge is going to be built, how can we do so to optimally benefit health? And we looked at transportation. So we commented on the fact that our uh, public transportation provider, TransLink, has um, has a goal of achieving 50% trips, 50% of all trips made by cycling, walking, and biking by 2040 or 2045. And so we asked for them to really consider how they're going, how this specific project would help meet those goals. So once we provided our first round of comments, the uh, proponent was able to provide us with their responses. And so we were given a Word document from, with all of the initial comments from all of the other stakeholders. And there were 272 comments made in total. So that's a lot of comments to go through for both the proponent as well as for us. Because it's nice for, it's, that was our first chance to see what other people had said. Um, so some of the samples of the responses that we got were that the criteria was health related, but it wasn't health specific. Um, in terms of determining um, which of the five options would be best suited for this region. Uh, Queue length may be a little bit longer in the Oak Street Bridge area. However, it should be noted that even without the project, queue length would continue to be longer and maybe even longer than that. Um, the assessment um, would look at the project scope. And so again, looking at one kilometer radius sort of around the project boundary. Um, greenhouse gas emissions would decrease, and there should be an overall benefit to air quality um, in the local assessment area, and the economic benefits are, are there. 
Um, but we disagreed. So we provided some more feedback again, and we said that from a health perspective, um, refusing to expand the local assessment area is unsatisfactory because so we continued with our recommendation to expand the local assessment area to the Oak Street Bridge, um, which is Oak and 70th as an intersection. And we continued to link the economic burden of health impacts um, and health care costs, particularly those to, um, linked to physical inactivity. And we said that the bridge may actually increase the number of drivers on the road and therefore make people more sedentary, keep them in their cars. Um, it's essentially promoting people to live the sedentary lifestyle um, and not try to integrate active transportation into their lifestyles. And we suggested that they continue working with TransLink. So TransLink at the time was also working on a Southwest Area Transportation Plan, which would have sort of encompassed that whole area and how they could better support the region or that specific region with public transportation. And so we really heavily encouraged the proponent to continue talking to TransLink so that they could sort of link up and figure out how they could meet TransLink's goals of getting 50% of all trips made by after transportation modes. So we were also gifted in March 2016 with the opportunity to comment and participate in the health impact assessment. And so it was the HIA, they did agree to do an HIA, um, but it was done at the same time as the D-AIR. So we were given a, the opportunity to help in some of the scoping. But beyond that, we were really constricted by the timeline. So we provided a list of comments, and we wrote a letter back, just or an email. I think we just sort of had some general comments in terms of, could you please state that the purpose of doing the health impact assessment is to assess the health impacts of the bridge as it is proposed? Can you? We recommended that um, the physical boundary be similar to that in the TransLink Southwest Area Transportation Plan. Um, we wanted to have the impact of road pricing options instead of tolling be um, part of the health impact assessment as well as including public transportation as part of active transportation. So not just using pedestrians and cyclists as your benchmark for active transportation, but using the acknowledgement that using public transportation can also impact physical activity levels. And we also recommended using the same timeline that they included in the original assessment. So going to 2031 as a temporal boundary, because what might seem as a, like a positive health impact currently might not be 20 years down the road. And so that was sort of the direction that we wanted them to start thinking about. Um, and unfortunately, we weren't, because we weren't included, some of these pieces were sort of seemed to be a little bit beyond the scope. And I think had we had a little bit more time, we would have been able to incorporate that a little bit more, a little bit better. But we were really bounded by this really tight timeline that they had. So once we reviewed the application, so we had two rounds of the draft information, draft air that came out. And so once we finished reviewing that, we were then given a screening table um, just to see if the air had everything that they said they were going to have. And so it was a little bit challenging because what we found was that we had enough time to sort of just make sure that all the content was there and that what they had said in one document was included in this document. But I found myself asking, okay, this is mentioned, but it's not explaining how far in depth and is just mentioning that we're going to talk about health sufficient um, or what level of detail is going to be enough. So as this was my first environmental assessment exposure, it was sort of, I found it really difficult to sort of say, okay, where is that line and what, what is enough and how much information is too much? Um, we didn't, because of that, we didn't end up providing that many comments. We provided some comments on formatting um, and then we asked for a copy of the HIA because it said that the HIA was completed and we hadn't seen a copy of it yet. So we asked for that to be provided and we asked to be identified as specific stakeholders. Following that, they gave us the application in the middle of the summer, in August, and we were given the application to review. 
And we were provided, again, the very similar table to what I just showed. Um, and we found, again, that a lot of our comments were really needing to be tailored specifically to the HIA because what we found was that because of the proponent's responses and refusal to expand the local assessment area, um, and um, they felt that things such as public transportation didn't fall under their scope of work, um, we were probably better off looking at things that were within their, their capacity to, to comment, to actually elaborate on, particularly with regards to design of the bridge um, and engineering. So we spoke to a lot of the final conclusions that were drawn out of the HIA, and we spoke to some of the weaknesses that we found in the HIA. So things such as transportation and equity, um, need to make sure a lot of the conclusions were based on the fact that trans public transportation funding has been fixed. Um, and for those of you who are in BC, um, you probably know that we have had some public transportation funding issues um, recently. And so that was something that we wanted to make sure was really clear when we wrote back to the proponents sort of saying, okay, well, you can make these conclusions, but we need to make sure that we have um, funding secured to make sure that a lot of the things that we want that you're saying are going to happen will happen. Um, and it became really clear to me that it was really difficult to start working in a multifaceted group. And in transportation, it becomes multifaceted very quickly because you not only have your transportation infrastructure, but you also have your public transportation groups and then your local government groups. And they each see themselves as taking care of only one part of the transportation piece. So MOTI, the proponent, didn't feel that public transportation fell under their scope of work, um, even though they're providing the tools for public transportation to work effectively. So they felt that the real success of having transit be effective fell onto the shoulders of TransLink. Um, so that was a little bit difficult to kind of wrap your head around and sort of get everybody's mind thinking in terms of like no silos work together. Um, so this shot is actually an aerial shot of the current George Massey configuration. So under the water is where the tunnel is. Um, and so the bottom part of the screen is the Delta side and the north part of the screen is the Richmond side. And this is what it will look like. Um, when the bridge goes through. So I thought that was quite interesting. It changes the landscape quite significantly. Um, that stretch of green is the D's blue that they are hoping to enhance. Um, and so following our submission of the application comments, application review comments, we received a response from MOTI in October 2016. And so instead of responding in the format, because of the way that they tailor their responses, we again found it quite difficult to respond in a matter that was effective for us to provide our comments back to them. And so we wrote a letter just sort of highlighting the opportunities missed, um, where there are benefits, where we saw potential benefits with the bridge, as well as how can we maximize the positive benefits and minimize the negative impacts to health based on this. So again, we pro provided commentary on the air quality and emphasizing that our feelings that the local air, or sorry, the LAA should continue to be expanded and that the expected mode chair shifts that they are expecting can't be confirmed without secured public transit funding. We didn't hear back, but in November 2016, we were provided with a draft referral package to go to the ministers for approval. So this is sort of the final step for them to get their environmental certificate. And here we were given the technical assessment report, project description, a table of conditions, and the map sheets that the ministers were going to get. So this is sort of the summary package that the ministers were receiving. And in reading this, we were a little disappointed because we found that our concerns were being minimized. So we weren't acknowledged as a, uh, as a stakeholder. And we didn't feel that our concerns were addressed sufficiently in the technical assessment report. So we highlighted the fact that we had brought up several concerns numerous times, um, such as air quality. So we had 
concerns regarding the initial scoping study for air quality. Um, traffic, we had numerous concerns on the queue lengths at Oak Street Bridge, and we had some concerns about the modal shift assumptions that were being proposed. So we made the following request. We asked that an amendment to the technical assessment report be included to include our concerns and include us. And then we wanted to be included as a stakeholder for the interagency working group and the transportation working group. We also wanted to include BCH as a stakeholder in the, in the development of the environmental assessment or environmental management plan. So once construction had been going through, we wanted to be part of that, um, the group to continue to evaluate the project. So we found that there were a number of struggles that we had as a team. Um, one being that this was a lot of people's first exposure to an environmental assessment. And so I think a lot of us didn't really quite know what we were getting into, what the scope of work was going to look like. And I, I'm pretty sure that even with the challenges that were faced in this project, going forward into another environmental assessment, it'll be much easier just because if you've gone through the process once, it automatically becomes easier. It's one of those things where the first meeting, everything makes sense in part, but once you start putting the pieces together, you get totally lost. And so um, now that I've kind of gone through the whole thing, it's easier to kind of explain it to other people. Um, and I think the next time I do one, it'll be easier to participate. We found that we had a lot of issues with time constraint and capacity. So the timelines are really, really tight. So we typically had about anywhere from two to three weeks. Um, but we are doing this on top of our regular job. So we had about four or five people in our group participating in the review. But a lot of the time, we ended up only having one or two people that were actually able to put time in and review the documents in, in their entirety. So for example, with the application review in the timeline, it said that we had 180 days, which sounds great, because that's six months. And we were like, awesome, we, we have tons of time. But in reality, we actually only had 30 days to review the application. Um, and that included weekends. And then we had to, the proponent had 15 days to respond to us, and then we were given an additional 25 days to provide a response back to them. And then they had to put their package together to send to the ministers. So that 180 days isn't actually all review process. It's the putting together of the entire application. So that wasn't clear until we actually got through that process. And what we found challenging is due to the nature and the perspective that we're taking with regards to the built environment, it's really easy to get very overwhelmed with the scale of potential for us to be involved and in where we see the health impacts. And it, it was really important for us to start scaling and deciding where is the biggest bang for our buck? Where can we provide the most significant uh, feedback to Ensure that we actually have some um, that we actually have some effect in the long run. So we focus a lot on again the air quality and the land use issues, transportation issues. Um, I think going beyond that, it just became really overbearing because we could say, well, we can make health effects linked to the Aboriginal concerns, cultural concerns, um, viewscape, green space wildlife concerns, but it just gets too onerous and it's, we're a really small group. So we need to sort of focus on what is the purpose of the project and where do we see the greatest impact to health. We also found that because there's no legislated context or requirement to consider the broader health context, um, it makes it, that also made it quite challenging. And so our participation, I think, for the EAO and MOTI was a little bit of a shock for them because they hadn't had that perspective and we they hadn't been asked to think about health beyond air quality and noise in the past. And so I think that was a challenge for all, all of us to kind of learn and figure out where is, how can we work together and where, where are we going to be able to provide some constructive feedback as opposed to just being part of the, the group. Um, so things such as equity issues, border boundaries, to fully assess air quality impacts, um, and looking at the 
the population as a whole and considering the fact that people don't just stay stagnant in one spot, they're moving from municipality to municipality, they cross borders, um, we're all mobile. So we, we don't just stay in one spot. So how can we do that? Um, we had a lot of challenges in terms of trying to get the elements in scope broadened as discussed. And we brought forward concerns that I think people don't typically consider as health concerns um, because they aren't immediate. So we're looking down the road. We're not saying, oh, well, you know, our air quality is particularly bad today, so people who have asthma are going to have really, a really hard time. We don't have those recommendations because we're actually thinking down the line, 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, what are the health impacts going to be if we have increased traffic? Um, but that's really challenging to try to get across to people. For us, it was really easy because we already, we've already bought in. We know that the health impacts of these types of projects can really have long-term effects down the road. But when you're trying to explain that to somebody who works in infrastructure, who works in something where you sort of see project A and project B, and once it's up, they're kind of hands off, it's really challenging for them to kind of grasp that concept. And so I think we still have a long ways to go in that. Um, I think what we find, um, we, we, we were trying to convince individuals who they design for car movement. They don't design for the movement of people. They design for cars. And so we're trying to change that philosophy. And we wanted to, we were contending with the idea that they thought that providing a cycling lane and a pedestrian bridge and an HOV lane equaled providing and supporting public transportation. And in my mind, over a three kilometer bridge, where you don't have that much in terms of a place to go to on either side of the bridge. Um, so you're looking at essentially a minimum four or five kilometer, I guess five or six kilometer walk or bike ride um, to get from one end to the other to actually get somewhere is not provision of active transportation space. Um, and so we need to kind of say, well, just because you build it doesn't mean that you're actually going to be encouraging people to use it. You need to not just build the infrastructure to be there, but it needs to be functional and desirable for people to use. So in terms of lessons learned, there, was, there were a number of them. Um, but we found that the earlier that our involvement, the better impacts and the better results we can have to impact health. Um, so things such as timing of conduction or timing to conduct the HIA really matters. Um, the proponent has actually had acknowledged a few times that it, the HIA that they had conducted was probably not done at the right time, um, and we obviously agreed with that. And it was done really quickly, which, um, I mean, in some cases can be really good, but I think to have a full assessment, um, we probably needed more than a really quick summary. Um, the HIA that they conducted was really confined to the bounds of the project, and they didn't consider the larger scope and the larger population um, beyond sort of what was already identified as a local assessment area. Uh, we also found that there's, we have a lot of work to do in terms of changing um, the built environment for health and getting people to buy into that concept. So um, having people understand that by affecting their built environment, you're affecting health is it's going to be challenging, and I think we still have a lot of work to do to try to get that perspective across. And some people will get it, um, planners might get it, but engineers might not, for example. Um, we probably would have benefited from providing a cover letter off the bat, sort of stating what our intentions were and where we wanted to go with things, just so that we would have lessened the needing to figure that part out as we're going through the process. Um, if we sort of just laid it out right up front, um, and I think having them think beyond the immediate health issues is going to be another challenge coming down the line. Uh, we probably would have benefited also from collaborating with other groups, such as local governments and Aboriginal groups, although I'm not sure whether or not it's better for each of us to be saying the same comments separately or to be jointly saying the same comments. Like I said, with the way that the table of providing, the ways that we are being asked to provide our comments might not actually work really well for a joint submission. 
So it's not clear to me sort of what, what might be more effective because the letters didn't seem to make their way into the comment period. Like they were, they're public record and they're online, but they're not, um, you know, in terms of the review package and what gets sent to the ministers, that might not be the most effective way. Um, but I think we can still provide the GMT as an example of where our collaborative voices could carry more weight in the future. Uh, what we did find is that the First Nations groups and Indigenous, po indigenous populations and the local governments and Metro Vancouver provided very similar comments to us. So I think by um, them knowing that we are also interested in the same things that they are, I think there's potential for better group work in the future, whether it be on a large infrastructure project like this one, or at least that they know that this is a direction that healthcare is interested in moving towards, and it's not just going to be all about you know, providing services and, um, you know, we are kind of looking down the line at how things can go. Um, again, a huge lesson learned for myself was that we can't tackle everything. We need to prioritize and it's a learning process. We're all learning and not only are we learning, but we're also trying to teach our proponents and the people who are in, being engaged in these projects, the proposers, um, what our visions are and how we want to go ahead and sort of build these communities. So in terms of what our impact was, I think we can say that persistence paid off, even though we didn't get what we wanted. We did get an HIA completed, and I do think that that is a win. Um, they could have very easily said, yes, we hear you, but we don't have time. And they did conduct one, and they also acknowledged the fact that it probably wasn't done at the right time. So I think those two acknowledgements from the proponent is actually a big deal. I think, you know, it's very easy to kind of say, okay, well, you know, we, they did one, wasn't what we wanted, and so that's not a good thing. But they actually did one. They were willing and receptive to our, to receive our ideas. And so hopefully in the future, um, we'll be able to be incorporated into large infrastructure projects at the right time or at least when we're coming to the table with these newfangled ideas, they won't be um, as shocked or they will have a little bit of a better understanding of the, re the direction that we're coming from. Um, and so, oh, this by the way, so the picture on the left is actually a picture of current traffic. Uh, I stole that from News 1130, so that's um, a traffic. <laughs> and news reporting uh, radio station in Vancouver. And the picture on the right is the new proposal. Um, so there's underpasses and overpasses and also no cars on it, so it looks fantastic right now. Um, but you can see in those pictures what the expansion of essentially the exact same area is going to look like in the future. So I think that's something. This, these, Pictures like this were really quite traumatic for us in terms of seeing what is the after effects and what I think it really speaks to how the built environment can kind of promote the use of vehicles. In terms of hope for the future, I think we had three takeaways. So we, I think the fact that the EAO and MOTI will maybe consider a more well-rounded and comprehensive health plan for the process is good. Um, and I think that they had a better understanding of the direction of public health. And I hope that we, in the future, will be invited to participate in these groups rather than sort of saying, knocking on doors and saying, hey, we're here, we really want to participate. They might just automatically think of us as being a potential collaborator or stakeholder. And I think that would be really beneficial. And keeping in mind that even though transition may be slow, um, it's going to be beneficial because our opinions and involvement will be just automatically there. We won't need to ask for that to be part of their, the solution. So the current status is that the project was issued their environmental assessment certificate in February 2013. The EAO proposed 33 conditions and requested that a certified project description be completed. Um, in terms of our request from our last letter to be part of the interagency working group, the transportation working group, and to review the draft environmental management plan once it was released, we were recently told, I think last week, that we are going to be part of the interagency working group. So that's good. 
Um, but the other requests right now are not clear. Um, I suspect that they're sort of just starting to put things together, and as the election's coming up, um, I don't think that we'll be hearing that much more until after the election. Um, but it's nice to kind of know that some of the components that we were asking for are being included, and they do see us as a valuable asset to the process. Um, and I think that we still have the opportunity to provide input and maximize positive health benefits and mitigate the negatives. And I spoke to our team. So these are the number, the number of numerous people that helped in the review process. Uh, we had our medical health officers, um, both local and our environmental health MHO, participate um, and help guide the direction. Um, we felt that it was really important to not only have representatives from either the built environment or environmental health um, field, but also people who have the regional or local context so that we weren't sort of saying things that didn't fit with that area. So if we had any recommendations, um, they would be a little bit more familiar with the ins and outs of the area, um, knowing if something is doable or not based on what recommendations we might be providing. And that's um, pretty typical as to how we end up doing our work. We want to make sure that what we're saying makes sense for the people that we're saying it to. Uh, so yeah, any questions? Thank you, Laura, for the very informative presentation. So we'll start with questions from in the room first. And in the meantime, people online, if you could type your questions into the chat box, We'll get to them accordingly. So do we have questions from um, in the room first? Uh, we'll go with, uh, yes. Okay. My name is Joanna, Joanna Rafael. I'm sorry, could you come up here? We Because uh, we have people online, so they'll, they, they would like to hear your question too. Is that possible? Uh, my name is Drona Rasali. I'm the Director for Population Health Surveillance and Epidemiology at BCCDC. Uh, my uh, question is said that uh, uh, health impact assessment has been completed now and uh, um, in terms of measurement, how much scope, uh, how many indicators uh, have been included and what is the scope uh, in terms of especially social determinants of health. You emphasize that. Uh, WHO um, definition is mm -hmm. quite wide. Have you all considered that? Uh, or we wanted uh, it to be included. Um, what we found was that the health impact assessment didn't actually speak very well to the, the components that we wanted. Yeah, yeah. And so, so in terms of indicators, they didn't really get, it was really more of a desktop HIA, just they, they, they had like six weeks to put it together. So it was really, really quick. Um, and we didn't find that it assessed everything that we really wanted to. They kind of just came to these conclusions without, with the assumption that public transportation funding was going to be available um, and that um, there would be some way of having uh, road tolling or road pricing sort of worked in there somehow. Um, but we didn't find that it was actually very comprehensive. It didn't answer a lot of our questions. Um, and that's where, you know, yes, they did one, but we didn't get anything near to what we wanted at all. Yeah, I imagine that. That's why I was raising that question. Uh, up in North, in resource development, we are trying to build a list of indicators and prioritize mm -hmm. them. How can we get a comprehensive view of social determinants of health in terms of social uh, health impact on, from the resource development? And this infrastructure uh, industry, yeah, this also needs to come, uh, include those uh, indicators. Yeah, yeah, and um, I just actually came from another meeting where we're talking about HIAs, and um, I think some of the things that we're struggling with right now is what are the trade-offs, or what is what is the benefit of doing an HIA if they're already doing a social impact assessment and an environmental um, assessment or you know, economic assessments, like do the conclusions, of what we've seen is like a lot of the conclusions end up being very similar, it's just how you get there is a little bit different. Um, and so I think for some of these larger infrastructure projects, an HIA might be 
beneficial. Like I think for a project like this one, they probably would have benefited from doing one when they were trying to decide which out of the five, um, whatever five um, options they had going forward would have been good. Um, and then I think having indicators and measurements and being able to read things out into the future would have been more effective. But right now, what they had put together for us didn't have that. Okay, thank you. So I, I find it baffling that we could get this far in a project like this and not have some uh, uh, integration of a public transit option on a bridge that's going to be spanning the, 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 the river uh, uh, in the way that this one is. And I'm a little bit confused that it could happen that we could get to the point of approving a bridge that doesn't have a whole section dedicated to public transit. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit, how even before all of the things that we've talked about, somebody didn't say in concept, we can't do something like this without engaging um, uh, with TransLink to include a, a public transit option that's more than an HLV bus, uh, bus lane. Um, the other question I have is, is, it looks like this is Vancouver Coastal. This terminates at, in Fraser Hill. Do they have a similar body that could be, could have been engaged to sort of bolster the, 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 the folks that are involved in pr promoting some alternative to the way the project unfolded? And I think there's an environmental health segment of the Center for Disease Control that I wonder if it wouldn't be, a, be appropriate to have pulled in at some point too, so that the collaborative body working on pushing for some kinds of alternatives might have been bigger. Yeah, so um, I don't want to, I mean, Fraser Health was actually very involved, in, in, engaged and involved in this process. Um, their medical health officer, uh, Lisa Liu, was very um, integral to speaking about the transportation effects with us. Um, she attended a lot of the transportation meetings with us, and we had a lot of conversations with the proponent on transportation. Um, but yeah, I mean, this was their first involvement in a project of this scale. Um, it, I think MOTI's and the EAO's first foray into including health into that discussion, Absolutely. which is, um, I mean, I know that Northern Health and, and for you know other projects, um, health is typically involved in, in some of the, you know, say, maybe not quite infrastructure, but they get involved in some of the like mining and, and those types of projects up north, but very, I mean, I think this is sort of the first time that we've really been engaged at this level. Um, so for sure, next time, I think there's a lot of potential for more collaborative efforts um, across groups. Uh, with respect to the public transportation piece, I can't really, I mean, this is part of the challenge that I was speaking to in terms of like they are saying that we're providing an HOV lane, a uh, transit lane, and we're providing space for potential rapid transit in the future if you get funding. Um, and that is sort of like, yes, we're committed to world cross transit. And TransLink was a part of, was an engaged stakeholder as a group. Um, but I, I don't, I think part of the, the issues are that there's like no mandates to get to that, that point. And again, like we've only, I mean, our team is quite new. We've only been in existence since 2014 as a, a built environment team with Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, and so I think for, for us to kind of get on board was one thing, and now we've kind of got to bring all these other um, groups, the infrastructure groups and engineering groups on board with understanding that some of these changes really impact, have significant impact for health, and that providing a bridge, providing just, you know, a bike lane and a pedestrian lane and uh, an HOV lane isn't enough, um, but we, we aren't there yet in terms of trying to, I mean, TransLink bought in, we work really well with TransLink, but um, going up the level. Well, why should it fall to Vancouver Coastal to resolve that? I would think that within a provincial context, there should be somebody that says, before we move forward on a mega project like this, we have to pull in everybody that's got a vested interest in how 
this project will impact the environment, not just the one health authority on one side of the bridge, but at, at a provincial level, right? Am I, am I missing something yet? It just seems weird that that yeah. hasn't been considered before somebody said, hey, here's an idea, let's build a bridge. What should it look like? Instead of halfway along the line, one health authority jumps in and says, well, hang on. Let's well, and like I said, Mae Fraser Health was, was involved in the process. Um, but again, like, you know, we were caught, we were all sort of asked to be part of the process late 2015, yeah. early 2016. Um, these discussions have been ongoing before our team was formulated. I mean, 2012, 2013 was probably when discussions about whether or not a bridge should or should not be built were happening. Um, and I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I, I guess I like don't my, my I, best response to you is go out and vote on May 9th. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to sound like I'm false. No. Great on you for doing this. Yeah. I wish more had. That's kind of Absolutely. a frustration. Absolutely. I and wish I think it was a bigger body that had pulled together to say, let's put the brakes on this and go back to step one. Absolutely. No, and, and um, it, that, that was a lot of the challenges. Like this entire process was very, very fast. Um, it was, to my understanding, a little obscure in terms of um, how it was presented and like the speed at which everything was done was quite fast in comparison to some other projects. Um, and so I think in, in that context, you know, we're limited by sort of the process. Um, <laughs> And hopefully in the future, I mean, the fact that at least they now know that this is where health authorities, both Fraser and Banks of Coastal Health, want to go, um, they might be a little bit more in tune with trying to engage us at an earlier stage, hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's a hope. So we're going to go to the questions online now, just uh, in the interest of time, we'll just see what they have. Um, so I think there was a question earlier about uh, whether the letter to proponents um, is public or it could be could be reviewed by others. I think you mentioned. I think they are. I can go back. Um, they would be on the George Matthew Tunnel website. So if you search George Matthew Tunnel on Google, it'll give you their their work group. But I can send that to Tina and I can highlight their what those are. Okay, it uh, looks like that's the only question from online. There was a, um, just a comment about the comments that, that you were raising. So okay. I guess we'll talk to, I'll talk to you about that later. Yeah, um, I'll see if I can find, find the letters online. Yeah. Okay. I'm pretty sure that they're public. Okay, great. So are there any other questions um, from in the room then? If there are none online. Okay, I guess that's what be it for today. Thank you for coming. No, I know, I totally agree.